This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human China rights today. issues are still. The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition Accident. Is making inferential discovery. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. The name we see Taylor is not well known in historical accounts of the civil rights movement. But yet this young African-American woman in the mid-1940s became the centerpiece of what became the civil rights movement as we know. When Reese Taylor was attacked by a group of young white men in 1944, the NAACP in Montgomery sent a young woman by the name of Rosa Parks to Alabama to investigate. No one knew who Rosa Parks was at that time, but of course a decade later, she would become one of the most celebrated figures in the Montgomery bus boycott and the burgeoning movement that we know as the Civil Rights Movement. We are joined this afternoon by Professor Danielle McGuire at Wayne State University to talk about her new book, At the Dark End of the Street, which accounts, gives us an account of the wonderful people who were at the focal point of the Civil Rights Movement, but a history that is not well known. And later we'll be joined by Professor Stephanie Dunn to talk about Morehouse College and a group of young men who call themselves the Plastics who are challenging the idea of the status quo of what black masculinity is in the 21st century. I'm Mark Anthony Neal and this is Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal and you're watching Left to Black. We have a special guest this afternoon, Professor Danielle McGuire, who is the author of the brand new book, At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape and Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement from Rosa Parks to the Rise of Black Power. Uh, professor McGuire joins us from her home in Detroit, where she is a professor of history at Wayne State. How are you doing this afternoon? Great, thanks for having me. Well, let me just start by congratulating you on, on what is just an incredible book. Um, Thank you. Fabulous history that gets unearthed. And, and I'd like to pick up on a little piece from the title, this, this idea that what we're getting really is a new history of the civil rights movement, right? That, that there's been something about this history that we all think that we know so well that has been uncovered. Um, and what has been uncovered is this kind of interesting history around gender and particularly sexual violence directed at black women. Uh, how did you get interested in this subject and in writing this book? It's a good question. I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison working with a fellow Duke professor now, Tim Tyson. Yeah, Tim Tyson, and one of our favorite people, as well as Craig <laughs> Werner, another one of our right, favorite Tim people. Tim Tyson and Craig Werner, they were my mentors and writing coaches and um, inspiration really. <laughs> They, uh, they taught me everything that I know. So if there's anything good about the book, it's because <laughs> of them. <laughs> right. But I was listening to NPR, and I was listening to a man talk about his experiences with the bus boycott. It was David, uh, I'm sorry, Joe Asbell. And he was the editor of the Montgomery Advertiser. And he talked about a woman named Gertrude Perkins. He said something like, Gertrude Perkins has never been mentioned in the history books, but mm. she had as much to do with the bus boycott as anyone on earth. Mm. And I thought that was really shocking because I didn't know who Gertrude Perkins was and I'd never read about her. So I ordered up the newspaper and started paging through the microfilm. And what I discovered was that Gertrude Perkins was an African-American woman who was raped by two white police officers in Montgomery in 1949. And she went and told her minister what happened and that was Reverend Solomon Say Sr. Yeah. He got together a coalition of people and they launched a public protest that forced a grand jury hearing and brought all the black ministers together to rally for the protection of black womanhood. And so I thought this was really astounding. I didn't know yet why it was connected to the Montgomery bus boycott, mm. but the fact that Joe Asbell said it was really important really got me interested in this topic and forced me to continue looking for connections. Now, now Miss Perkins is, is one of the many stars, if you will, of this book. Mm -hmm. um, seemingly the person that, that, that grounds your study is, is Reese Taylor. That's right. Uh, I'm going back to the Abbeville affair. Um, here we have another case of a young woman um, who is sexually assaulted, who's raped um, by a group of young white men. Mm -hmm. um, and they begin to, group of folks see what's going on and they begin to challenge um, the way that black women's bodies are treated and tossed aside, and tossed aside in the Deep South. 
And, and one of the people who gets sent to Alabama um, to investigate this case and to begin to build a coalition is a younger Rosa Parks. Um, and, right. and we get a piece of this story. When we think Rosa Parks it, and we think about all our kids in school, it's a story of the Montgomery bus boycott and her decision, you know, as you talk about in the book, the cartoon, that talks about how Rosa Parks' feet were just tired. Right. <laughs> she didn't want to get up anymore. And, and right. you know, we get this story of her as kind of an accident of history, but, but what you show in your book is that it, there's a larger history of, of militant engagement, of political activism um, that perfectly explains what happens in Montgomery you know, right. in the next decade. Can you talk about Rosa Parks and this Abby Villavare, you know, with um, Reese Taylor? Yeah, Rosa Parks was the Montgomery NAACP's best detective. I mean, her title hmm. was secretary of the NAACP, and so we assume that she just took notes at meetings right. and right. filed paperwork, but she was really their lead investigator. And what that meant was that in the 1940s, as early as 1943, they would send Rosa out to interview victims of racial injustice and to document brutalities. And then she would bring those notes back to the Montgomery branch office and her and Edie Nixon and others would basically decide whether or not they were going to press a case and whether or not they were going to take it public with a protest. So in 1944, Rosa Parks went to see Recy Taylor. Recy Taylor, like you said, was walking home from a church revival and a carload of white men abducted her off the street and gang raped her at gunpoint. And Rosa Parks took notes on that brutal assault. You know, Reese Taylor testified about it. That's how Rosa Parks found out about it. Mm -hmm. So Rosa Parks takes the story back to Montgomery and they launch a really a national campaign to free or to get justice for Reese Taylor. And the Chicago Defender calls it the largest campaign for equal justice to be seen in a decade. They basically compare it to the campaign for the Scottsboro defendants. Right. And I went through thousands of postcards in the Alabama Department of Archives and History with names from all over the country. So this was really a national movement to secure justice for Reese Taylor and Rosa Parks is instrumental in getting that together. And part of the reason why she's able to do that is because she's so connected to militants and activists in Alabama. Her husband was a defender for the Scottsboro Boys and helped raise money. He's one of the original founders of the Montgomery NAACP. She's neighbors with Edie Nixon, who's the president of the Alabama Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters, and he's head on and off of the Montgomery NAACP throughout the 1940s. So she's just linked in to an underground network of activists and militants and had been for a really long time. And, so and, you, and you mentioned her grandfather, right, as, as instilling right. a kind of very early race pride in her, um, yeah. even around folks like Marcus Garvey. That's right, her grandfather's a Garveyite. And he raises, you know, he helps to raise Rosa to believe that black is beautiful and that she shouldn't accept mistreatment from anybody. And even as a child, Rosa Parks is very, well, it's Rosa McCauley then, but she's very defiant. You know, when yeah. white kids bully her, she fights back. And she is not accustomed to mistreatment. She does not want to, you know, she won't take mistreatment. She boycotted James Blake's bus, you know, for 13 years. That's the bus that she finally, you right. know, refused to stand up on. So, so she's a sharp detective. She's an activist. She's a militant race woman. And she's, you know, educated in black nationalist tradition and grows up with a feeling of black pride. So this is not some tired seamstress with yeah. tired feet. It, you know, we, we have a very simple image of her, and she's so much more interesting than that. You're watching Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and we're here with our guest, Professor Danielle McGuire, who is a professor of history at Wayne State, and the author of the brand new book, At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape, and Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement from Rosa Parks to Block Power. One of the things that struck me in reading the book, Danielle, um, and, and, you know, the exhaustive research that you do, but at every turn, there's just another story mm. of violence. Mm -hmm. um, another story of violence in which, you know, folks who do the violence aren't held accountable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a researcher, you know, how did you decide which stories? Because uh, I could imagine there were literally hundreds of other stories that you could have told, um, but you just didn't have the time and the space to do it. Right. What dictated for you the, the stories that you wanted to tell around black women's resistance to sexual violence and, and the way that was at the center of what becomes this very broad mainstream civil rights movement, you know, a decade yeah. later. Yeah, there were so many cases and, and there's probably so many more where mm. women didn't testify mm. about what happened mm. to them. They didn't tell anyone and so it didn't show up in the public record. Mm -hmm. So most of the cases that I write about 
the ones that I spend time on, I was able to find a paper trail. I was able to find court records or newspaper articles. Um, I was able to find pamphlets or postcards protesting the assaults, you know, letters to the editors in black newspapers and sometimes even in white newspapers from black women who protested what was happening. So the cases where there's where there was a large archival trail are the ones that I focused on. Um, of course, that left a lot out. And there were lots of stories that I just didn't include because I didn't know what happened and I couldn't follow up on them in any real way. Right, and you were being a good historian, so <laughs> we Trying. understand. Um, two figures um, that I think are extraordinary to this story, um, Mary Louise Smith um, and of course uh, Claudette Colvin. Um, and these are names that some people know about, right. um, but most folks don't know. And, and they, of course, are the women who come before, almost immediately before Rosa Parks in Montgomery. And, and you tell the story of why the Montgomery, you know, which in the early stages of the Montgomery in, Improvement Association, you know, felt that these weren't the right kind of women. Right. What, what, do, what do you mean by the right, or what did E.D. Nixon mean? Right. You know, when he said that these were not the right kind of m women to go forward to do the kind of mass movement that Rosa Parks eventually became the centerpiece of. Yeah, it meant that they weren't respectable enough to withstand media criticism. And you had to put it in context. So it's 1955, and the Brown decision happened in 1954. And the Brown decision, you know, where the Supreme Court banned segregation of public schools, put whites into a frenzy, particularly segregationists, who feared that integration automatically meant interracial sex, you know, miscegenation, that this would lead to, as Citizens Council members put it, amalgamation. Um, and so white people were really concerned with this idea of interracial sex, as they were any time African Americans got closer towards a political and legal equality. You know, you see this, this fear of interracial sexuality being used by whites as a way to try to destroy the freedom movement. So Edie Nixon had to perform a kind of cruel triage. I mean, he knew what was possible, what was politically possible at the time. And putting forward Claudette Colvin, who was from a working class background, and then it turned out became pregnant, wasn't going to be the kind of symbol of segregation that would win a media campaign. Right. And the same was true for Mary Louise Smith, uh, who again was from a lower class background and who, who didn't have respectable parents. And so, and I think partly it, it's that both of them were darker complected. Right. So Edie right. Nixon is aware of those uh, intraracial prejudices and interracial politics that would enable a campaign to succeed or fail. And so he's really cautious about that. So when Rosa Parks gets arrested, he's gleeful. You know, he's so <laughs> excited. He's like, this is it. This is the woman. You know, we're doing it. And the women in the Women's Political Council, like Joanne Robinson, you know, they were furious because they wanted to launch a boycott when Claudette Colvin was arrested. Yeah. They didn't care that she came from a working class background. They thought that that was ideal because right. most of the women who right. rode the buses were right. working class. Right. So she was one right. of them. Yeah. Right. You in the book, 20 years after the Montgomery bus boycott, um, right here in North Carolina, the case mm -hmm. of, of Joan Little. And suddenly the very issues of res black respectability that you talk about the 1950s, right, in some ways they're off the table now. We're, we're looking at a woman who is in jail um, for things that she legitimately needed to be in jail for, right. right? She's a criminal. She's a criminal. There's no question about that. But yet she is also subjected um, to sexual violence in jail and, and she kill, kills her jailer, mm -hmm. um, is on the run and then, you know, comes back in. And she's defended by a white male lawyer, but also a black woman, right? the first black, gra black female graduate of Duke University's law school. Um, and, and you mentioned how this case you know, gives you an indication of how the times had shifted, not just in terms of the fact that folks weren't concerned about necessarily who Joan Little was, but the interesting collection of people who come together to defend her. So you got the National Organization of Women, you have Maluna Karinga and his organization, Us. You have right. the Black Panther Party. In some way, you know, it's a very motley group of folks coming together, but it also spoke to where the political times were at the time. Could you talk a little bit about the Joan Little case and what kind of ramifications it had, you know, in comparison to the past of black women's violence and sexuality, but also going forward? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think this is why we call it a politics of respectability, because it depends yeah. on the politics at the time. Yeah, and respectability yeah. can be used as a tool to move forward or or it can be, you know, thrown out. 
And so what you see throughout history is this sort of tension between respectability and testimony. So in the 1940s, you have someone like Recy Taylor, who's a sharecropper and who is not respectable. She's not middle class. She's working class who, you know, all kinds of people rally around. And you have people like Rosalie Ingram, who's also a sharecropper with, you know, 10 children who murders her assailant and the same kinds of respectable organizations rally to her defense. By the 1950s, that's impossible because of the backlash to Brown. By the 1970s, you have this moment again where respectability is not as important because you've got a whole different political situation. Whites are are on the ropes, so to speak. You know, segregation yeah. in legal terms has been it's dismantled, yeah. Yeah. right? It's it's coming apart. And so respectability isn't as important for African Americans as a political tool as it was in the 1950s and early 1960s. There's still this issue, of course, with the fact that Joan Little is a criminal. But by the 1970s, you also have a movement among whites and blacks uh, against repression in the prisons and against brutality in the prisons. And you see that coming from people in the black power movement as mm-hmm. well as feminist movements as well. So, you know, Joanne Little sort of represents all of these political moments that are kind of coming together. The women's rights movement, you know, is appalled that a woman could be treated so horribly in prison. People who are fighting for justice in prisons are appalled that she was abused in prison Mm -hmm. and used it as an example to promote their activism. And so you see she becomes, again, kind of a perfect uh, victim, so to speak, you know, for all these disparate groups to rally around. And it's a fascinating case. I mean, I think it really echoes the kind of movements that happened in the 1940s. But she's still a criminal, and you still need a jury to find her a sympathetic victim right and so they use karen galloway who is middle class who is a graduate of duke law who's african-american as a kind of mirror image and jerry paul little's other attorney basically believed that if he could get the jury to see joanne little as karen galloway then he could win the case and in many ways i think that's exactly what happened so respectability matters but in a different way you're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with our guest, Danielle McGuire, author of the new book, At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape and Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement from Rosa Parks to the Rise of Black Power. One of the strongest arguments, if not the strongest argument of your book, Danielle, is this idea that whatever we think of the civil rights movement, it is fundamentally grounded in issues surrounding the protection of black women's bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, but very rarely do we ever think or discuss the civil rights movement in that context. Mm-hmm. What do you think are the reasons, ultimately, that this very powerful narrative, you know, has kind of been shoved to the side, been marginalized from our mainstream understanding of what the civil rights movement was and what it ultimately was about? Part of it, I think, has to do with what we call it, a civil rights movement, which, you know, makes us focus on things like access to Uh, public accommodations, civil rights, makes us focus on things like access to the ballot box and politics. When, you know, if we were to call it a struggle for human rights, or as Hassan Jeffries calls it, freedom rights, Mm. then I Mm. think we would have a different conversation. Because as Ella Baker put it right, freedom is bigger than a hamburger. And access to the ballot box or access to the front of the bus doesn't mean a thing if you can't walk home from church or work or school without being molested. So having, you know, the ability to be able to protect yourself, having bodily integrity is so crucial to basic human rights that it astounds me that it hasn't been included in the histories of the civil rights movement. But I also think that we're uncomfortable with sexual violence. We're uncomfortable with talking about women's special vulnerability Uh, both racially and sexually, in the segregated South. And so historians have, for some reason, I think, overlooked this topic. I mean, we see a discussion of these issues in histories of slavery and histories uh, of Reconstruction. And so I think that the civil rights movement historians are catching up to to those studies. But I think that we're still uncomfortable with talking about the issue of sexual violence. And that's a problem because black women at least the ones that I write about, had been testifying about this for a long, long time. And so they were willing to speak out. Why are we willing to silence them? 
and that's what I try to, I try to give them a megaphone. Thank you, uh, and, and you did a fabulous job of that, no question. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, while you're still kind of basking in the glow of, of this wonderful achievement, what's next for you, Danielle? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I, I'm toying with the idea of writing a book about the Detroit riot in mm. 1967. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go here, people want to talk about it. Everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated by it. It seems that this area, people in this area have a hard time getting over it, you know? And a lot of people blame the current conditions in Detroit on the riot, which is just silly. Um, so I'm interested in that, but otherwise I'm not sure. I'm really <laughs> not sure. Well, you have some time to worry about that, given how great this new book is. Um, congratulations you. again. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. You've been watching Left to Black. We've been joined this afternoon by Professor Danielle McGuire, Professor of History at Wayne State University in Detroit. She's the author of the brand new critically acclaimed book, At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape and Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement from Rosa Parks to the Rise of Black Power. Thank you for joining us, Danielle. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Take care. All right. Woke up this morning with my mind Staying on freedom Well, I woke up this morning with my mind Oh, Lord Staying on freedom If you tell anybody that we blindfolded you, you take you to the world. So if you tell anybody, I said, we're going to kill you wherever we find you. I said, I left my baby home with my husband. I said, if you let me go home, I won't tell nobody. But as soon as I got out, I told him. Two policemen had picked you up and taken her down on the railroad and had all types of sick relations with her at that particular time. Well, let me tell you, there's no more wailing. No more, no more wailing. wailing. No more wailing over me. Before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. And go home to my Lord and be free. And the dark end of the street. That's where, where we always. You know, Morehouse is a private institution. They are allowed to do whatever they want. When you apply to that school, you sign up to abide by their rules in order to accept their sort of inst instruction. That's just the way it is. And if you go to any other institution, you have to abide by their rules. It's, you know, honestly, you should be able to dress any way you want to. But like I said, when it's a private school, you got to follow the rules. The way I look at it is you might have the right to cross dress if you want to. But in the business world, no one's going to give a man a job wearing a dress in front of him. That's just the way it is. Well, I think it's a publicity stunt for the group of guys that are, you know, involving themselves in this type of activity on campus. Because you know that's something you usually won't find on that campus. It's a private school at that. And it's like, okay, you already have strict dress codes. Why would you even... Why would you break them and then, you know, go against certain society standards as far as, you know, dressing like a woman? So they're bringing attention towards herself and they're looking for it. They're looking for any type of trouble or problems it's going to bring. I'm Mark Anthony Neal and you're watching Left to Black. We are joined now by Professor Stephanie Dunn, Morehouse Professor of English, also the author of the recent book, Bad Bitches and Sassy Supermamas. Black Power 
Action Figures, uh, which of course is a book about black women in the black exploitation era. So Stephanie, you are down in Atlanta in the ATL. I am. Down in the Atlanta University Center. Yes. And there was a lot of chatter coming from there yesterday. Uh, Aaliyah King, who is an author and writer for Vibe Magazine, just did an interesting piece, a very provocative piece called Morehouse's Mean Girls. And it's about a collection, collective of young men who are at Morehouse who are pushing the boundaries and challenging the status quo about what exactly the performance of masculinity is. Uh, they are in fact cross-dressers uh, who are making an interesting kind of commentary on what black masculinity looks like in the 21st century, but also how black masculinity looks like at an institution that has been responsible for producing so many quote unquote great race men. So how are you feeling about all this chatter about your institution? And what are your feelings about the plastic people as they've been called? A couple of <laughs> things, of course. Uh, it is definitely the subject of hot debate and conversation on the campus, as you can imagine. Um, it's the conversation that has greeted me um, when I went into various classes yesterday, I mean, it was basically we had to take class time and really address the article and talk about the feelings of the students. The one thing I want to, um, to say is that many of the young men who are current students at Morehouse are very concerned about how they are represented, to, represented as contemporary Morehouse men, as, mm -hmm. you know, Renaissance men to, mm -hmm. to uh, coin uh, Dr. Franklin's uh, tag. So they're very concerned about any dominant narratives that perhaps don't show the diversity, the multiplicity, right, of who they are in the 21st century as far as this historically black college. So some of them, and some of this does stem from this heterosexual orientation and I think concerns about um, being viewed, right, as a school um, that is basically a haven. Some of that is there for, you know, homosexuality. That, that is there. However, there is very, I think, valid and real concern about the types of narratives that the media and that people generally want to publish and focus on that don't necessarily suggest the diversity, even in terms of sexuality, mm -hmm. um, as well as representation. Um, and they don't, they're not necessarily interested in hearing the voices of uh, non-gay, right. you know, uh, young black men too. And so they're very concerned about that, and I'm concerned about that as well. So I think that everything, this, this type of story, I have real problems with it, not because it covered the topic that it did, but in the manner that it was handled. And because I'm very um, acutely sensitive to the way that these young men are feeling about mm -hmm. not having their voices, mm -hmm. right, in the fray or the attention on the multiplicity mm -hmm. of that student population. So that's really a, a point of concern. And, and the way that this, this story has been covered, not necessarily by Ms. King, but folks who've commented on it since then, it, it really becomes a black and white issue, right? Two sides, uh, the young men who are cross-dressing, and of course, what is the perception of a large conservative group of black men at Morehouse who might in fact be homophobic. Now, that's, yeah. Yeah, and that's problematic as well, because I would say that the conversation, because the issue and even the dynamics of the way these things play out on campus are far more complex and complicated yeah than is generally being allowed in public discussions of the matter. Yeah. And that is, a, it, you know, to have dumbed down conversations of this, I think it's very problematic. To, to, and it's a, it does a disadvantage to those young men who were interviewed, the cross-dressers, the, the gay um, former students who were interviewed, as well as the students that, you know, the, mm -hmm. the heterosexual population of students who we haven't really heard from or really have this sort of like in-depth interrogation or analysis of from their end. Now, this is not necessarily a new debate at Morehouse. This story comes almost a year to the time when Morehouse passed a dress code. Um, a year ago this time, President Franklin, you know, basically carried the water for the Board of Trustees at Morehouse for this idea that a, a Morehouse man should look like a Morehouse man. And there's lots of chatter about this last year because, you know, the, the dress code was very specific about sagging about wearing hats in classrooms and in other public places. But it's also very explicit about men who wear pumps, about men who might be carrying handbags, about men who might be carrying skirts and dresses. 
And there are a lot of folks at the time that felt that even the naming of such an explicit dress code was not necessarily aimed at the quote unquote hip hop thug, you know, that, that we think about in terms of sagging, but was actually much more directed at this group of, of young men who were cross-dressing. And it raised questions at the time, you know, well, how significant of a population is this that's at Morehouse that is really challenging these boundaries? And, and, and I think in some ways, both in terms of a real critical sense, but also kind of playfully winking at this performance of masculinity, you know, at some place like Morehouse that, that might, may not hold water, you know, a, as we go forward in the 21st century. Well, there, there are two things. One is that it's very problematic. And I know in the article, one of the, you know, the students was saying how, you know, the dress code policy targeted, you know, that population specifically, um, which is something that I disagree with because I can tell you as a person who's inside the house, so to speak, right, <laughs> and having these discussions with students and eavesdropping a bit, I, I must say, as I'm walking through and, that you know, they're not quite aware that you're on the scene, that the number one thing that I do believe motivated this actual, um, this actual dress code policy a year ago, which I wrote about as well, was, re was really the sagging problem. However, because the one sub subject is, is hotter, it's the hot subject, it's yeah. the taboo subject, yeah. it's the subject that we're still struggling to deal with, it has to deal with sexuality and issues of that, then it gets more of the attention and more of the focus, and I think wrongly so, because indeed what we miss out in these conversations is that things can also be um, sort of anti-different displays of heterosexual identity. Oh, yes. So these gentlemen who were performing a certain masculinity that was hip-hop edge were very much targeted yeah. in terms of the sagging pants. It's the conversation that we have the most. I've never had a conversation with a student about wearing pants, but I guarantee you that to this day, even to rebellious students, I'm having continuous conversations that you know, being in with, please pull your pants up, yeah. you know, please cover the underwear. And I think that is greatly ignored about the ways that many students who sag were feeling very targeted, right, and feeling very upset about the censor, as they took it, of their mode of expression for their generation. The other thing I want to point out is that while we're talking about, you know, this sort of performance of masculinity, we need to really be widening this conversation to talk about the dynamics of performing gender. Because not only is there performances of masculinity, but as, as a woman too, and as a, a person who does gender studies and so forth, I'm very concerned about what the implications are for this performance of femininity. Yeah. Um, the name of the, the group given in the Vibe article, The Plastics, which draws from this very sort of Eurocentric sort of um, teen girl sort of like, yeah. you know, femininity on right. display in a particular sort of like cult movie, correct? Right. Um, does a certain sort of performance, right, of femininities, of notions of femininity. So while we're talking about how they're pushing boundaries with masculinity, we need to talk about, you know, question, I think, what, what we consider transgressive in terms of the ways that it tries to perform certain femininities, because I, I think that it presumes that there are notions of femininity of who women are that are set. And that, that, you know, by doing this or by wearing pumps, by wearing et cetera, et cetera, one is crossing the boundaries of masculinity into femininity. But if masculinity is fluid, then so is femininity yeah. as well. And so we need to be talking about all of these performativities and the problematics or dynamics of these things. And, and that's one of the, the more interesting things about this. I mean, I, I think as a culture, we presume that when we see men who cross-dress, that, that obviously they must be same sex, you know, into same sex desire, same sex uh, interaction, you know, that they're gay. And yet, you know, we see the case of someone like Saul Williams, you know, who comes to perform at, Mel ha at Morehouse, and out of solidarity, he performs in a dress. And, and again, you know, you're talking about the fact that that gender is not static, right? And someone's performance agenda does not easily correlate to their sexuality. And I think, you know, in some ways, I mean, that's the more healthy part of this discussion, right? How do we have a more open discussion about performances of gender, right? At the same time that we're dealing with the realities of where sexuality is, and particularly in black communities at this point in time. I mean, what I think, I think that's really interesting about this story, I mean, this, this story breaks on National Coming Out Day. Um, so, so already we're having interesting conversations around sexuality. You know, it's a month into this 
controversy with Bishop Long, right, which in the worst case scenario is the case of a very powerful black male minister coercing young men into same-sex relations with him, right? It, it, I mean, that's the worst case scenario that we could potentially be looking at. At the same time, you know, we've had a rash of young people, you know, who have killed themselves um, because of being bullied around the idea of their sexuality. And of course, just this weekend up in New York City, we have the case of nine young men, you know, who attack and sodomize um, three young men because they were suspected of being gay. Does this conversation now um, really allow us to have the kind of conversation that we need to have at places like Morehouse, in black churches, in other black institutions, where we can really get conversations about sexuality out on the table in ways that are going to be safe and productive for everyone involved? I hope so. That's the best case scenario, is that it would facilitate smart, more profound, a more enlightening, and hopefully transformative um, dialogues. I, I have a fear that it may not translate into that because there are, I think that's, that's the limit sometimes of public dialogue is that still media to some extent, you know, certain media delights in the sensational and it's more about, right, sort of stirring a, a sort of, you know, sort of a frenzy about things and not really towards enlightening conversation. We at Morehouse and the students are, are trying to discuss, you know, where to go next in terms of having just what you're talking about, which is a smart dialogue that does not just dissolve into a we, they, you know, sort of like, you know, dynamic, or that doesn't just, you know, resolve into a discussion about, you know, um, of homophobia, because the conversation has to cover that, but it also, as I said, has to cover what it, what the, this conversation about identity and the fluidity of identity and you know, as one of my students put it yesterday, well, it, you know, it's making us come. I mean, I asked them, what is making you uncomfortable? What is the thing? Because there's the question, what is a man? And then what is a Morehouse man? man right. And if the one is not willing to be a man or what we our notion of what a man, man is, is yeah. then how can he be a Morehouse man? Right. See, and so this is a valid conversation that we absolutely need to have. But I think just saying Morehouse is this, you know, homophobic place that et cetera, et cetera, is 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 really sort of a futile um, because it is a, a microcosm of the uh, the society right. that we live in. It is it is just a a community within the larger community that has issues dealing with notions that sexuality is fluid that you can't just see it and name it. Yeah. You know that that one right and even right. even the, even the categories of male and female. If we think about it, then what do we do with people who are born with both sexual parts? Right. Right. And, and I think the thing that's really interesting about this, you know, is that when you go back and think of the tip drill controversy at Spelman six years ago, um, that historically black colleges and universities continue to be a learning lab for really cutting edge issues around identity and sexuality in black America. You know, ironically, you know, the Washington, the Wall Street Journal can do a piece two weeks ago you know, claiming that historically black colleges and universities are no longer useful, right? That, that they're not doing important work. And here, this is just another example of, of how these institutions have, are really cutting edge learning labs for us to think about black identity going into the 21st century. Absolutely, I told my students that yesterday. I said, you're in the unique position of being between two sort of legacies. The one is a past legacy that you are sort of walking on. It's the legacy of the Benjamin Mazes and of the Kings. And there is a, cert a certain sort of classic, a notion of classic gentlemanliness, right, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is implicit in that legacy. But you're also in a contemporary time where we are questioning and where we are interrogating and where we are challenging boundaries, right, that were not, you know, you know, types of boundaries that we were having as much public dialogue about and questions about, but you also have the burden of defining. I mean, who a Morehouse man is not set in any type of stone. Right. So right. that in, in some ways it respectfully cannot be, be modeled just through perhaps our esteemed leaders, you know, I, ideology of what would, you know, you know, constitute yeah. proper Morehouse man. It can't be that either, just that. It also can't be solely defined by the mean girls right. either, right? right. It, there, somewhere in between is this current generation that must take the leadership role in defining the multiplicity of these voices and saying, this is who we are, whether it's we're lots of people, right, in the 21st century, 
and where we're heading. And this is how we are, the past is valid for us. And this is how, right, the, the, this is valid for us. But ultimately, they've got to lead the way. Right. This right. is the movement of their times. And I think that an article like this and the debate about it is perhaps waking up our students that there are causes, there are movements, there the times are calling them. Yeah. Right? In much the same way that they have called previous generations. It's just that the subject material, it is it's just different. Right. information is different. Yeah, you know, we all love Benjamin Mays, but Benjamin Mays has not walked the earth in some time. I think that's a critical point to remember. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and, and you are watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We are here with a, a regular contributor, Stephanie Dunn, professor of English at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Your recent column this week uh, at, the Lump, at the Loop 21 is on our man Robert Sylvester Kelly. And you had this moment, you know, listening to Mr. Kelly's new song that, that gave you reason to pause. Um, what's up with R. Kelly these days? <laughs> you know, and, and R. Kelly is also a perfect man of the times to be discussing what we just discussed in terms of the difficulties and the problems and the challenges of discussing sexuality and complex identities, right, in the public sphere. He is the perfect sort of conversation mm. for this larger conversation. Um, R. Kelly, as we know, has been through, um, you know, a period where he's had to defend himself, right, against and had these legal woes. At the same time, he put out music that was, I think, I, I think you might have said this when we were kind of chatting about it previously, you know, he has to pay, you know, pay the legal bills and yeah. so forth. <laughs> and I, I think that a lot of his work over the last five years were really just, it, it was a more stuff that was being put out to, you know, to stay visible, but also to sort of make the money, et cetera. To keep it moving, um, yeah. <laughs> and now he is transitioning, and I think he is in some ways feeling freer, perhaps, to return to some of those autobi autobiographical, mm -hmm. I dare say, as mm -hmm. well as sort of more profound um, themes that we know interspersed through all that, that hot, you know, dance hall music, there have been you know, plenty of music where we have thoughtful R. Kelly, right, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. is telling us something, who is trying to share something, who is trying to interrogate and ask questions, right, about his society, about himself. And I think he is in one of those moments right now, and it's very going to be very interesting to watch. You know, one of the things that, that's interesting about Kelly, and, you know, if you ask the public what they think about R. Kelly, you'll get a range of emotions. Um, the, the thing that will come up all the time is this certain kind of connection to vulgarity, um, hypersexuality, um, in ways that are clearly problematic, right? We think about things like feeling on your booty, um, you know, those kind of songs, right? But of course, a, a closer examination of R. Kelly's body of work, you know, shows something that is not only something that, you know, that's hard to wrap our head around, in, in some ways, he has been one of, if not the best songwriter uh, of his generation, right? One of the best producers of his generation, one of the best arrangers of his generation, right? You know, it's only R. Kelly and, f for instance, Michelle and Dago Cella who've used the work of Paul Reiser, you know, the, the great arranger who arranged stuff from Motown like Papa Was a Rolling Stone to give it that classic sound. Um, you know, he's been described in other contexts as an archivist. Of, of rhythm and blues music, right? So when you hear this new song, you know, you hear Jackie Wilson, you've heard Donny Hathaway in his previous music. Um, what do you think he need to do at this point in time? You know, the, the criminal case notwithstanding, you know, to reconnect with an audience to get him, folks to see him for the musical genius that he is, right? You know, at the same time that we hold him accountable for what may have been missteps and, and even criminal behavior, you know, in the past. Two things. R. Kelly, I would argue, is at his best when he is allowing himself to openly wander about things, to be vulnerable in his music. Mm -hmm. So when I think about, to me, what have been some of his most compelling tracks, something like I Wish, and, you know, these Instead things... Instead of throwing stones at me, somebody pray for me, right? It's like, it's like folks didn't hear those it, kinds of lyrics, yeah. That, that <laughs> is R. Kelly at his best. It's not when he's necessarily being the, you know, the bump and grind guy, although right. let's not deny that part of him. And I don't think we, we need to because the secular has always <laughs> been part of a great many of right. our right 
um, right. soldiers who we now valorize and glamorize despite their personal. Right. I mean, what what was James Brown talking about when he said mother popcorn? Right. 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 Let's not whiten, you know, <laughs> yeah. the sexual and even the graphic, you know, displays of sexuality that were implicit in their performance right. of right. their music. Right. Old school music. It was there. And R. Kelly, in some ways. His is the contemporary version of some of that performance of sexuality. Yeah. Even whether we have issues with that or not, it is. But he is at his best when he is letting that vulnerable R. Kelly, who hasn't quite figured it all out, right? right. Who is right. basically almost letting his journal be put to music. Yeah. Then he is at his absolutely best, I argue, <laughs> in terms of lyrics and also in terms of the actual music. This new album, I hear, um, is R. Kelly in a way that we're reminded that we have to take him critically seriously, right, right? in terms of his musicianship. He is the premier, most pro uh, prolific, I, I would argue, R&B artist in the last 20 years, bar none. He absolutely yeah. is that. And he's also, I say in the article, that he marries hip-hop, yeah. R&B, and soul. This is one of the things that makes him so intriguing and such. He has the touch of musical genius in him, right? And so we can't dismiss him as merely this vocal artist, right, who makes that nasty music and, you know, <laughs> you know it's that he's not just popular. His longevity suggests, right, his projects, his thoughtful writing suggests that he is much more than that at the same time, right? Simultaneously, we have to not try to romanticize him and feel the need to turn him into a saint or vehemently defend him to, to the point where we can't talk about what is problematic about yeah. his issues of sexuality and the way he has reacted in, in regard to young girls? What is that about? And I would say that R. Kelly himself is still trying to figure out R. Kelly. Yeah. And that the more he figures that out, because I think that this is a thoughtful dude, to tell you the truth. I think mm -hmm. this is a very thoughtful dude who has been very confused who has been trying to sort himself out. And I think as he is sorting himself out, we are going to get slices of that in his music. Right, and, and it's no different than what we saw, the struggles that Marvin Gaye had publicly with his own demons that came out in his work. Uh, Miles Davis, you know, the kind of beauty and bittersweet quality of Miles Davis's work was him kind of dealing with those challenges also. Yeah, but we have to talk about domestic violence and we right. have to talk, right? If we talk about Miles Davis, we have to own the genius of him. He right. does not belong, belong in the dustbin right. because he was right. violent towards women at times in his life, right? But at the same time, a conversation about him can't try to, as I said, over romanticize him as a figure, but must deal with him in the complicated ways that I think that he forces us to think about him. Yeah. We've been joined by Professor Stephanie Dunn, a professor of English at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. She's also a regular contributor to the loop21.com, a regular contributor to Left the Black, and most recently the author of Bad Bitches and Sassy Supermamas, Black Power Action Figures. Uh, which was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2008. Thanks for joining us, Stephanie. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and you've been watching Left of Black. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.